morning again. If you have your Bible or your device or your phone, uh, please turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. In just a few moments, I'm going to read one verse from there. So, so parents, let me ask you today, how many of you ever heard these words coming from your teenager? I'm starving. <laughs> I'm, I am dying of hunger. I, I'm famished. You ever hear that from your kids? Uh, we had two teenage boys growing up in the house, and, and, and I promise we would feed them, and we would feed them well. Vicky's a fantastic cook. I mean, we would stuff the living daylights out of them. And 30 minutes later, I'm starving, Dad. And we're like, how can you be starving? You just ate just a few minutes ago. Uh, maybe you've said that. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, man, I hope Brian gets done quick because I am uh, starving. I am famished today. Well, experts tell us that uh, you do not die from hunger in just a couple of hours, all right? You, you do not die from thirst after just a short period of time. Experts tell us that the average person can go 30 days without food, and the average person can go three days without water. I don't recommend you do that, but the experts tell us that we can do that. Um, I say that because I am confident that most of us here today have no idea what it really means to be hungry. Most of us here today don't have any idea what it really means to be thirsty. And, and by the way, Let's just pause and give thanks for the fact that we live in the United States of America and we have access to plenty of food and plenty of water. Just because we don't understand what real hunger is and real thirst is doesn't mean that there aren't people around the world who have truly been dying of hunger and people who have truly been dying of thirst. I say that because um, as a result, it's difficult for us to understand the significance of what Jesus is saying in today's text. We read it, but, but if we're not careful, we read it and understand it from our Americanized mentality. We read it and understand it, um, realizing that we're gonna leave here and probably go eat a big lunch and, and you know drink more than we should drink, probably non-alcoholic, that's what I'm saying, all right, okay. <laughs> As a result, it's difficult for us to understand what Jesus is saying. So, so, so here's what we need today. We need the Holy Spirit of God to teach us. We need the Holy Spirit of God to help us to understand a truth that is foreign to us. A truth that Jesus desires to drive home to our hearts and our minds. So, so Matthew chapter 5 and, and verse 6 just a short verse. Jesus says this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Would you read that with me today? Let's read it together. Let's read it all together. It's up on the screen. So yeah, I know we all have different versions. Let's read it out of the ESV, which I'm reading from today so that we all read it together. Would you read it with me today? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus says, for they shall be filled. Would you pray with me today? Lord, we need you this morning. We're so guilty of reading through Scripture and not even really pausing to comprehend it, to read it for reading's sake and not allow the truth to really penetrate into our hearts and into our minds. And so today we ask that you would teach us a concept that is foreign to us. Help us to realize what it means to be hungry and thirsty. Lord, not for physical food and physical water, but I pray today that you would help us to be hungry and thirsty for you. Give us a craving for you, God, that, that nothing in this world can satisfy. 
Give us such a passion for you that it drives us to you. Give us a desire to not only know you, but give us a desire to be like you. Give us a, a, a hunger to not only understand your righteousness, but give us a hunger to live out your righteousness in our lives. And we recognize today that we cannot do that on our own. And so this morning, corporately and individually, we, we open ourselves up to you. We ask that you would teach us. We ask that you would fill us. We ask that you would help us to be what you desire for us to be. And we thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're in the middle of a series that we've simply called Flipped. We're studying the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. The idea being that Jesus desires to take our lives and literally turn them upside down, to literally make us into something that is not natural for us to be ourselves, but, but to flip us and turn us around so that we literally become what and who Jesus wants us to be, and so that we can live that out, so that we can be salt and light in a dark and in a sinful world. The last few weeks, we've slowly been going through the first verses of these cha this chapter. We've been studying what is known as the Beatitudes, simple declarations that Jesus has made to us, declarations which demonstrate how he wants us to be, how we should live, and how we should act and respond. As we've seen the last few weeks, these, these beatitudes are filled with what we'd call paradoxes, a paradox, something that initially doesn't make sense, but, but when examined, it proves to be accurate. Today's verse is completely paradoxical. No one who is starving would describe himself or herself as being happy. I don't think we'd, you'll find anybody in our society or any place around the world that would say, man, I am so hungry and I'm happy about it. Uh, to the contrary, in our culture, happiness is generally associated with what? A full stomach. If you're from uh, um, Spanish descent, you're familiar probably with the phrase, pan llena, corazón contento. Eh? Full stomach happy hearts. There's times that I come in, and, and believe it or not, I'm not always in the best mood. Isn't that right, Vicki? Every once in a while, I come in in a bad mood. Every other year or something like that, you know, I, I'll come in and, or every other day, maybe that's what it is. I'm not sure which one it is. And so I'll come in, and I won't be in the best mood, and Vicki will want to talk to me about something, and she'll see I'm not in the best mood, and she'll say, hold on, eat something. All right, I'm not going to talk to you about this until you eat something because you're going to be much happier after you eat, all right? I confess, I am much happier on a full stomach than I am on an empty stomach. Can I get an amen, guys? I think you can relate with what I'm talking about. In this verse, though, Jesus is not talking about physical hunger. Jesus is not talking about physical thirst. He's talking about spiritual hunger. He's talking about spiritual thirst. He is comparing spiritual hunger to physical hunger. Now, think with me today. In our secularized culture, if I asked you, which is worse, to be physically hungry or to be spiritually hungry? Many of us, many people today would say, why, it's, it's so much more dangerous to be physically starving than it is spiritually starving because you can die from physical hunger. And yet what we fail to realize is, yes, you can die from physical hunger, and people that go days without eating can physically die, but you can also die of spiritual hunger. And though we have full bellies in our country, and though we have jam-packed refrigerators, and we have restaurants on every corner, we are starving as a people. We're not starving for physical food. 
were starving for, for spiritual food. Mother Teresa, the Catholic missionary in India, made this statement, very profound statement. She said, people in India are physically hungry. People in America are spiritually hungry. That makes people in India better off because Americans don't realize why they are starving. And quite frankly, we live in a culture that is starving spiritually. And if we're not careful, our churches are filled with people who are starving spiritually. They have all that they want to eat physically, and yet spiritually their bodies and their souls are becoming emaciated. They are starving themselves to death. But sadly, they just don't know it. That's what Jesus is talking about in this verse. Blessed, happy are those who are hungry, who are thirsty for righteousness, for they will be filled. And so today I want us to kind of dissect this verse, really small verse. I want us to, to dissect it so that we can fully comprehend the truth that Jesus wants us to know and as a result apply it to our lives. So I have three simple questions that I want to ask as we walk through this passage today. The first question is this, what does the word righteousness mean? Because Jesus said, blessed are those who hungry and who are hungry and thirsty, who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so I think we must comprehend what that word righteousness means so that we know whether we hunger for it, so that we know whether we thirst for it, so that we know whether we are desiring it or not. The word righteousness is found 92 times in the New Testament. I found it interesting that 34 of those times it's found in the book of Romans as, as the apostle Paul lays out the gospel. The, the Greek word, I won't try to pronounce it, but the Greek word is translated not only righteousness, but it's also translated justice, and it's also translated justness. When used in reference to God, because many times the word is used not in reference to us, but it's used in reference to God, calling God righteous. When used in reference to God, it speaks of God's divine character, uh, stating that God is holy. God is innately perfect. God is always right. Even in recent weeks, we've, we've quoted that verse that says, Will not God, the judge of all the earth, always do what is right? And though we might not understand at times all that God is doing, we must recognize that God is innately good. God is innately perfect. God is innately holy. God is innately just. He is innately righteous. It's part of his character. Psalm 119 and verse 37, the psalmist says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. Psalm 119, obviously, is a chapter dedicated to the Word of God. And, and, and David says, God, not only are you righteous, but all of your commands in Scripture are righteous as well. Psalm 119, 142, your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. The Apostle Paul, when he was talking about the end of his life and receiving a crown in 2 Timothy 4.8, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, notice how he describes him, the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day. And so it's important for us to realize that God is righteous. When used, when the word is used in reference to God, it's speaking of his divine character, who he is. Is. But the word in the New Testament is not just used speaking of God, but it's used speaking of us. Speaking of the fact that righteousness is something that we should desire and righteousness is something that should be demonstrated through our lives. So when it talks about righteousness in reference to us, what does it mean? I put in your outlines that the word righteousness simply means, we could give more profound definitions, but it simply means to be in right standing with God. And so when I'm righteous, when you are righteous, it means that at that moment we are in right standing with God. In other words, everything between me and God is okay, all right? God is cool with me, all right? He, 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 is, he, is, he is okay. My standing with him at that moment 
is right. Now, let me flesh that out before you get the wrong concepts. When an individual is described as being righteous, it is not talking about our own goodness. When the Bible talks about you being righteous, it's not talking about, man, you are a really good person. It's not talking about our own goodness, but rather the fact that we are in good standing with God, not because of us, but because of Jesus. All right, so, so let's, let's kind of talk about that just a little more so we understand that concept. If you're following along in your outlines, I made this statement. As sinners, we are incapable of having any righteousness of our own. As sinners, we are completely incapable of having any righteousness of our own. So, so pause just for a second and think about the best thing that you've done in the past 24 hours. I mean, the thing that you did that you thought God was up in heaven going, good job. You know, you know, giving you a round of applause. Think of that best thing you did. I mean, maybe, maybe your wife made a smart aleck remark to you and you wanted to say something back, back, but you bit your tongue and you walked away and you thought, boy, I bet God's pleased with that. <laughs> or maybe this morning you got up and your body hurts and, man, you didn't want to come to church, but you, man, you got ready, and you came to church, and you walked through these doors thinking, man, I bet God is pleased with me today. Or just maybe you wrote a great big check to church today, and you thought when you wrote it, you know, you kind of thought, kind of waved it so God could see what it is. (laughs) All right, $10 extra this week, Lord, and you put it in the plate. That, uh, That was that good deed. Think of the best thing you did this week. The best thing that you did this week and the best thing that I did this week isn't good enough. It's not good enough. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, the prophet says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. I say that often. What does the word all mean? All, every single one of them, all of our righteous deeds, the best things that we do, the things that make us pause and say, wow, that was good, are like a polluted garment in God's eyes. The Apostle Paul, as he gives his testimony in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, Paul says, and being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. And so here's the simple truth. None of us here today have any righteousness of our own. And I would pause and say, man, if your game plan, if your spiritual game plan is, okay, here's what's going to happen. When I die, I'm going to show up to heaven and I'm going to pull out a list of all the good things that I've done. And I'm pretty confident God's going to say, Man, are we lucky to have you here. Enter into the joy of the Lord. If that's your game plan, you're in deep trouble. Because you can never be good enough. And by the way, neither can I. Neither can the best person that you and I know. Well, you sit back and say, well, wait a second, Brian, if, if we're supposed to demonstrate, if we're supposed to have righteousness, and if my righteousness is not good enough, man, what in the world am I supposed to do? Where is our hope? Notice the next phrase that I put in your outline. Our only hope is to desire, to claim, and to apply by faith the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again, that is so important. Our only hope, my only hope, your only hope is to desire, to claim, and to apply the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let me finish that verse I read just a few moments ago, Philippians chapter three and verse nine. Paul says, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, in other words, comes from doing good things, But that which comes through, notice what it says, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends 
on faith. Our only hope, our only hope is the desire to claim by faith and to apply the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, so how does that happen in our lives? You, you might say, Banks, okay, Brian, uh, and I get it conce- conceptually, but, but, but how does that take place in your life and mine? Notice two things, extremely important. When we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are declared righteous. That's salvation. Let me say it again. When we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are declared righteous. That's salvation. Actually, the New Testament term is the term justification. It means to be declared righteous in the sight of God, just as if we never, ever sinned. So, so, so here's what happens. All right, let's imagine. I was saved, um, I was saved 47 years ago. So as a six-year-old boy, I was incredibly wicked, all right? My mom is here today. She can tell you how wicked I was as a six-year-old boy. Incredibly wicked, all right? As a six-year-old boy, I realized the truth of the Bible, that I was a sinner. All of us are sinners. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and, and, and fallen short of, uh, of the perfection of God. And so as a six-year-old boy, I realized that I was a sinner, that I would never, no matter how many years I lived, I would never be good enough. And so uh, I knelt on a couch there at 1512 25th Street in Canton, Ohio. And in my little six-year-old voice and with my little six-year-old childlike faith, I repented of my sin. And I asked Jesus to be my savior. I didn't understand. I'd never heard at that time the word justification, didn't know what it meant. But here's what took place at that moment. At that moment, there was a divine decree that came out from heaven. At that moment, God the Father looked down at Brian Burkholder and declared me righteous, just as if I never, ever sinned, and just as if I never, ever would sin. You see, when we by faith claim what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, we are declared righteous. Here's two verses, Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. Notice what Paul says. The righteousness of God, how is it received? Through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2 says this. Therefore, since we have been justified, that word justified means declared righteous. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we understand righteousness, righteousness is not something that that I demonstrate. It's not something that I fabricate. It's not something that I make up. It's something that God gives to me. And it's something that God gives to you at the moment of salvation. By the way, that's the only way we could ever, ever, ever get into heaven because we could never be good enough to enter into heaven with our own righteousness. We need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what happens at salvation. But but there's a second aspect of God's righteousness that applies to us on a daily basis. We use the term sanctification. Notice in in your outline, as we daily look to Jesus, he makes us more like himself, infusing his righteousness into our lives. What is that? That is sanctification. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. Notice what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 1.30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Notice this phrase. Who became to us wisdom from God. And so Jesus Christ becomes to us and for us the wisdom of God. Notice the next word. Righteousness sanctification, and redemption. And so Jesus not only gives us that, that, that positional righteousness, the moment that we trust Christ as our personal Savior, but day in and day out, as we strive to become the people who God wants us to be, he gives us that daily provision of righteousness so that we might live righteously. How is it? Remember, I mean... 
Some of you have such tremendous testimonies. Remember what you were like five years ago before you knew Christ? Remember what you were like last year? Remember what you were like last month? And, and, and you see how God is changing you. That's not because of you. Don't pat yourself on the back as if you were something special. All right? You're only being able to change. Why? Because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that God is giving in to, to you, infusing in your life, helping you to become victorious in your life. Having said that, I think it's completely valid as believers for us in the morning as we spend time with God to ask God, God, today, give me your righteousness. Give me today the ability to respond to my wife as you would respond to her. Give me the ability to put up with my boss as you would put up with my boss. Give me the patience to hold my tongue as I drive in this Miami traffic. Believe it or not, that's possible. That's possible. But not because of you and not because of me. Only because of Jesus. And so when Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He's not talking about anything that you and I fabricate. He's talking about something that is totally, 100% given to us by God. Positionally, when we became believers, and daily as we trust him to live out the truth of the gospel. The idea is that every day you and I claim the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His perfect life is not only our example, but his perfect life and death is also the power by which we are able to live righteously. So, so, so here, let, let, let's make it practical. If you are struggling in your Christian life, it's, it's simply because you are not depending enough on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you're struggling with your tongue, if you're struggling with your temper, if you're struggling with your thought life, it's because you are not claiming the victory that is already yours and by faith asking God to help you become victorious in that. I think we have this erroneous concept in Christianity that it has to be because of us. We trust God for salvation, and then the rest is up to us. Good luck. The rest isn't up to us. We trust in him. And he is the one who molds us and shapes us into his image. And as we, by faith, day in and day out, claim his righteousness, he changes us. So what is? What does it mean to be righteous? Righteous is correct standing before God. That God looking down on us and please, not because of us, but because of him seeing Jesus in us. Let me answer a second question quickly. Then what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? So Jesus says, okay, we understand what righteousness means. So what does that mean then, Brian, to hunger and thirst after that? Well, first of all, he's not talking about a mild hunger pain, all right? Has anybody, all right, I'm going to ask you to call out the person beside you, all right? Anybody heard somebody's stomach growl during the service yet, all right? Anybody? If you were standing up here, you'd have heard my stomach growl just a little bit, all right? I'm anxious, all right? Within about an hour, we're going to be eating lunch, all right? I got these mild hunger pains that's happening right now. You do too. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about, oh, your stomach growling just a little bit for my righteousness. He's not talking about mild hunger pains, but rather an intense craving. The word that, that Jesus uses are the strongest terms that can be employed to describe hunger and thirst. Hey, hey, hey catch it. A starving person has a single all-consuming passion. At that moment, to a person that's starving, to a person that's dying from thirst, there is only one thing that matters. To the starving person, the only thing that matters is food. To the thirsty person, the only thing that matters is water. That's it. Nothing else matters. The Bible talks about that, Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. 
My soul thirsts for you, God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 63, 1, oh God, you are my God. I earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So when Jesus says, happy are those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, he's talking about this intense, all-consuming passion. Okay, can I break that down just a little bit more? I gave you three phrases. The first is this. What does that mean? There is a realization of our own unrighteousness. There's a realization of our own unrighteousness. We've kind of seen that in the Beatitudes so far. If you, think, if you remember the three Beatitudes that we've already talked about, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. We realize our own sinful condition to be poor in spirit realizes that I have this poverty. There's nothing in and of me that can save me. I desperately need God. We realize that. We mourn. He says, blessed are those who mourn. He's not talking about those that are mourning for a loved one that just passed, even though he gives comfort to those people. But he's talking about a mourning for our sin, a brokenness for our sin, realizing that our sin, whatever it is, grieves a holy and righteous God. And because of that, we mourn. And Brad beautifully illustrated last week what it means to be meek. Blessed are the meek, those that are afflicted in this world, those that realize that their only hope is God. God is their future. So then Jesus comes in the fourth beatitude, and having laid all of that out, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who who." realize their own sinful condition and their need of me. The second thing I I wrote is this, and we could talk about this for a while. There is a dissatisfaction with what the world offers. There's a dissatisfaction with what the world offers. So imagine someone knocks at your door. Hard for us to comprehend. We've never experienced it. Someone knocks at your door. Their lips are not only parched. Their lips are cracking, all right, bleeding, They haven't drank in several days. And they knock on your door, desperate, almost crawling to your door. And you open it up, and they're saying, I'm thirsty. Give me something to drink. And you look at them and say, hey, I don't have any water. But man, there's a football game in here. Come in here and watch this football game with me. That's going to satisfy your desire. Is that going to help them? (laughs) Or, Or, you know what? I don't have anything to give you. But man, I got this cool motorcycle. Hop on. Let's go take a motorcycle ride. Or let's just go look. You know what you need? You need to go to the ocean and experience the beauty of God's creation. That's what you need. The person is like, no, that's not what I need. Give me something to drink. Those other things, what? Do not satisfy the need that I have. I believe there's many believers today that are trying to satisfy the need in their soul that can only be satisfied by God with things that this world offers. Uh, if I only had a new car, I'd be happy. I'd be happy with a new car. You know what? If I didn't have this house that had so many problems in it, if I could have a better house, then I would truly be happy. Oh, If I only had a better husband, (laughs) if I had a better husband who loved me like I deserve to be loved, I would be happy. If I had a 96-inch screen television (laughs) and I could watch the Super Bowl, then I would really be happy. And what we don't realize is none of those things, none of those things satisfies the thirsting of our soul. They're a temporary fix. To be hungry and thirsty for God is is a discontentedness with the things that this world offers. There's a third phrase. There's a craving for the word of God. A craving. Did you ever have a craving? 
You ever have a cry? I mean, some of you ladies have been pregnant. You know what I'm talking about, all right? All right? All right? One o'clock in the morning, I need ice cream. All right? There's this craving that you, I mean, maybe you felt it last night and you're not pregnant. I don't have any idea. But you had this craving that, that, that only this thing could satisfy. And at that moment, you were able to go anywhere. You were, you were willing to pay any price to satisfy that craving. When was the last time you craved God's word? When was the last time you woke up in the morning and your only desire was to spend time with God? Didn't turn the television on, didn't look at your phone, didn't grab your iPad and check your Facebook page, didn't do any of that. You had one passion. You woke up desperate to hear from God. They tell us that today's church in the United States, today's evangelical church in the United States is the most biblically literate generation in the history of our country. Why is that? We have so many other things that distract us. We have so many other things that we think satisfy the craving of our soul. And so our Bible, God's holy word, God's personalized message to us sits on the table, crying out to us, and we're too busy to read it. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness. Peter 2.2 2 says this, like newborn babes, long for the spiritual milk of the word, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Wonder why you're not growing spiritually? Wonder why the same things that defeated you five years ago are still defeating you today? It's because you're not spending time in the Word of God. As you spend time in God's Word, God infuses His truth, His righteousness into your life and into mine. Here's what I want you to catch. Righteousness is just as necessary for our spiritual life as food and water are for our physical life. Righteousness is just as necessary for our spiritual life as food and water are for our physical life. Just as not eating weakens you, not spending time with God weakens you. And at times, church, I'm afraid that we have a church as a whole, not just ours, the body of Christ that is weak, that is debilitated, that has no strength, that cannot live in a way that the light of Jesus Christ shines through us. Why? Because we're not spending time in God's word. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let me give you one third question. The third question is this. What is the promise for those who long for righteousness? What's the promise? Notice, Jesus doesn't mince words. Listen, we believe that every word of God is inspired, so every word is important for us. So he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied for they shall be filled. Just a couple of thoughts. Jesus is not speaking of instant gratification, but rather he's speaking of a continual fulfillment of our deepest desires. The word that Jesus used was one that was employed to describe the feeding of animals until they were completely satisfied. So here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus says that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be given total 
satisfaction, total satisfaction. And you, may, you might be like Mick Jagger today and say, man, I can't get no satisfaction. That's because you're looking in the wrong place. Because Jesus says, listen, I will give you total satisfaction, complete satisfaction. Here's some verses, Psalm 107 and verse 9. He satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Jeremiah 31, 4, my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. John 4, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Well, those are pretty strong words. So let me ask you today, where does your satisfaction come from? All right, let's, let's just imagine for a second that today we lost everything. Stock market crashes. Your 401k all of a sudden has nothing in it. Our grid system here in the United States goes haywire and you go home and there's no electricity in your house. You get a call from your boss. I'm not sure how you're gonna get a call from your boss because the grid is down, but you get a call from your boss <laughs> somehow. Listen, I didn't say this analogy worked perfect. Just follow it, okay? <laughs> you get a call from your boss and says, don't come in tomorrow. You don't have a job anymore. NBA All-Star Game is on this afternoon, and you can't watch it because there's no electricity. And you are left with absolutely nothing. Can you be happy? Can you be happy? What makes you happy today? Where do you find your satisfaction? Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I want to be the sole source of your happiness. I want to be the sole source of your satisfaction. I want you to find all of your satisfaction in me, all of it, completely. Seek first the kingdom of God, catch it, and his what? His righteousness. And then all these things will be added to you. We have a tendency to say, oh God, give me all these things. And then I'll look for your righteousness. And Jesus says, no, you seek my righteousness first. And you will be happy. Blessed are those who hunger for me. Blessed are those who thirst for me, for they shall be satisfied. Not an instant gratification, but a continual, deep-seated gratification, satisfaction in our lives that can only come from Jesus. That's true happiness. That's what God offers you. A happiness that when you lose that person closest to you, you're able to demonstrate the joy of the Lord. A happiness that when all of a sudden your health is taken from you, you're able to experience the joy of the Lord. A happiness that whenever you do lose your job, it's coming one of these days for many of us. When that happens, you can demonstrate happiness because your happiness is not found in anything that you have, anything that you purchased, or anything that you want. Your happiness is found in Jesus and Jesus alone, because you've made the determination, I'm gonna seek him with everything I am, with an all-consuming 
passion. I want Jesus. And when you do that, he gives you happiness not only in this life, but it only gets better because he gives you happiness in the life to come. Thank you.